Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us in our continuing uh, SG's uh, our reading series uh, with, our, with our opportunity to, to uh, spend time with the authors of some of the books on the SG's reading list. And today uh, we are thrilled uh, to have Mr. Brian Dorries uh, here uh, to discuss his book, uh, Theater of War. And time permitting, perhaps we can touch on uh, his book, uh, his graphic novel, uh, with, uh, with the Odyssey of, of Sergeant Brennan. But uh, in any event, uh, just for everybody's awareness, if you haven't joined us before, uh, I'm, an, I'm an avid reader. I've always found it a, a very valuable adjunct uh, you know, to my personal and professional development, of both nonfiction and fiction. The SG's reading list is, is uh, divided uh, into the four categories, the four Ps. Uh, and uh, uh, both of uh, Mr. Dory's books are on the SG's reading list. And I just offer the reading list as an opportunity to, to see some things I've found compelling. Uh, and today we get to, we get, to get into in-depth uh, with, with uh, uh, Mr. Dory's. And so we were so, so grateful for him, uh, not only for providing his time today, but for addressing some issues that that we uh, that we deal with and giving us a, a vehicle by which we can deal with some significant issues that are that our uh, war fighters and their families face. I will say this is this is going to be interactive. Uh, I'll ask a couple of questions to get started, uh, but then uh, uh, we're monitoring uh, and and I'll be the intermediary to ask your questions. So please please uh, send those to us. So with that. Um, uh, Brian, thank you again uh, for joining us. Uh, I think your work is tremendous. Uh, I really enjoyed reading the book and understanding the different ways that you've been able to use uh, Greek tragedy uh, to help uh, communities uh, to heal after after trauma, be it be it in our case in the military or after natural disasters, uh, as an example. Can you, uh, for the benefit of the audience, maybe those who haven't had a chance yet to read the book. Uh, can you uh, just discuss kind of what what is a Greek tragedy and and why are they important to us today? Oh, thanks. Thanks so much, Admiral Gillingham, for the opportunity to speak with you and um, some of your staff and the general public as well for opening us up on Facebook Live. I was thrilled by the invitation and um, delighted to be in dialogue with you. Um, I would define Greek tragedy as a story about people learning too late. And usually in a Greek tragedy, those individuals learn milliseconds too late. And in those milliseconds, they destroy themselves and their families for generations to come. That's what happens on stage in a Greek tragedy. But um, I, I would argue, and I argue in my book and in the work that we do with military and other audiences, um, that watching people learn too late, milliseconds too late, provokes a sense of attention, a situational awareness that we didn't have before. And it's about you know, people who serve in the military know that, you know, life is fleeting and happiness is fleeting. And there's a fragility to human existence that being brought into constant contact with the stakes of life and death reinforces over and over again. Um, Greek tragedy reinforces it without actual violence but creates a space where people can be brought into an awareness of the fragility of life, of the fleeting possibility of making change. And I'm a big believer in the possibility of change before it's too late. And so when we perform Greek tragedies for military audiences, which I talk a lot about in the book, and we have for the last almost 15 years, what we see in the audience isn't people going home, you know, um, overwhelmed with the futility of, um, you know, their lives and their ability to make choices in the face of these great um, forces that are at work against them, like gods and weather and fate and luck and government um, chance. You know, what we see is people um, buzzing with a new energy of possibility of seeking change and seeking wellness. And that sounds counterintuitive when you talk about Greek tragedy, but I just wanted to sort of paint a larger picture that I think Greek tragedy um, portrays people learning too late so we don't have to learn too late. And, um, and that, that's been the principal lesson for me over the last almost 15 years of doing this work. Yeah, thank you. And I, and I uh, should have mentioned that 
uh, in addition to being a writer and a director and translator, you're, you're the uh, artistic director of Theater of War Productions. And so since 2009, is my understanding, or even beyond, actually 2007, uh, doing the public math, um, you, uh, you have actually brought these, these Greek tragedies to life. Uh, you've tailored those performances uh, and actually had some very high level actors uh, portray these. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so, uh, and as an evangelist of, of ancient stories. And, and so I really, really enjoyed reading about your journey. Can you, can you take us back as, you know, I, I thought the story of how you met with a, a professor emeritus and, <laughs> and you realized that how you would, how you would channel what you had learned in studying uh, ancient languages uh, how do you make that transition? Could you could you explain that to? Yeah, I had incredible fortune, a privileged you know opportunity to study at a liberal arts college in the middle of rural Ohio, where there was no you know question of one's food security or safety or you know where where all one could do is study and learn and think great thoughts, as my father used to say. So um, I had this incredible privilege of studying under this emeritus professor of classics and religion. Um, a, a German Jew who'd survived, whose family had survived the Holocaust, but lost a huge portion of his extended family, who came to the United States and brought with him a kind of European learning that um, came over in the 40s at the, with the Holocaust. And he knew purportedly 25 languages and uh, was conversant in ancient languages in a way that very few ever are. And I sought him out my sophomore year at Kenyon College, where I attended college to study ancient Hebrew. But what it turned out to be was a, a, essentially a three-year tutorial on how to read. And, um, and I guess the short answer to your question, sir, is what the principal lesson that Dr. Kuhlman, who was my mentor, taught me was that the secret to reading, he would often say, is to close the book. And um, at first I didn't know what he meant. And then he said, in the olden days, in his thick German accent, we would read a paragraph in a book and then we would close the book and think to ourselves, now what have I just read? And he says, in the olden days, we used to smoke a pipe or a cigarette, but you don't smoke, do you, Brian, in this exchange? <laughs> and, um, you know, this idea, this metaphor of closing the book, I, think, I, I would argue sort of characterizes the rest of my career from that point forward. I studied Greek, Latin, Hebrew, some Aramaic and German. We did biblical exegesis where we would read three lines in the, um, in the, of the Old Testament in Hebrew, in Greek, in Latin, in German, in English, and with concordances spread out all over the table, chasing etymologies and histories of words so that the act of reading itself was slowed to such a pace that um, it changed my orientation to what it meant to read in that way. The other assignment that he gave uh, was to read the, a paper of record. At the time he thought the New York Times was the paper of record until it went to color. Uh, and then he thought civilization had come to an end um, when it went from black and white to cover, but color. But he said, um, one of the jobs of each day of our work in philology, which in Greek means the love of words, the study of the love of words, is um, to connect what we're reading in these ancient texts to the present moment. And that assignment became the sort of fabric of the work that we do now at Theater of War Productions and in my writing and in the various book projects. So part of closing the book for me was about closing the book and asking, what have I just read? And then connecting it with things that I knew were happening in the world around me. And it became clear, not right away, because I was young when this is all imparted on me, but as I accrued my own life experiences of caregiving, of losing people I loved, of stepping out of the world of privilege that I'd occupied and into other worlds and seeing how people were suffering, um, that there was ample opportunity to connect with these myths of the ancient world by way of people who were living in the present world and they were living out lives of mythological proportions. I mean, the first time we performed ancient Greek tragedy for Marines or for soldiers uh, in a sort of an audience, um, a, uh, a soldier came up to me afterwards. This was actually at a conference. It wasn't the first time, it was the second time. He came up to me and he said, um, I thought this was gonna be highfalutin poetry. I thought this was gonna be un completely 
inaccessible to me and my wife. And my wife and I sat in the audience and we watched Sophocles Ajax perform. And I whispered to her, I said that to you last night in our kitchen. That, that myths of the ancient world and even the extremities of Greek tragedy itself and all the emotions that are on stage aren't removed if they are kitchen sink realism in your daily life, if your life has been that extreme in some way. So that part of the journey for me out of college was getting out from behind the desk, taking off the stricture of academia, sloughing off. My parents were both professors and or my father was a professor, my mother was a counselor, but getting out of the, that world and venturing out to find new ways of understanding these texts by way of audiences that may never have heard of them, but by virtue of their life experiences had more to teach me than I to teach them. And, and that's what led to hospitals and the hospitals led to military and the military led to prison and the prison led to end of life care and addiction. And now we have 28 projects that all use ancient Greek or ancient texts or seminal texts to frame community-driven conversations uh, about some of the most pressing topics of our time. And, um, and so that's the sort of uh, freeze-dried version of the story. But, um, but Dr. Coleman and I, uh, we didn't see eye to eye at the end of my tutorials with him. And we got into, as one often does with one's mentor, kind of an impasse. And then if he died a few years later, but I'd like to think that seeing what I've done now, he would appreciate why I didn't become a professor of classics and why it was so important to go out into the world and find new ways of understanding these texts by way of the lessons he taught me about how to read. Boy, that's, that's compelling. And thank you. And so, so given that background, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'd, I'd love to, if you, if you could kind of recount your first encounter with the United States Marine Corps. Sure. So you're, you're seeing a, you're seeing an opportunity. You're seeing a population of, of folks coming back from, from war, uh, uh, you know, experiencing post-traumatic stress. And, and so uh, you linked up with Captain Nash, who's actually, uh, I, I had worked with him when I was in San Diego and a, a real mentor in terms of understanding uh, the psychiatric, uh, you know, impact of, of, of war. But so, so bring it, take us back to that uh, Hyatt ballroom in San Diego. Well, look, I, I didn't know anyone in the military when we got started. Um, I was a, I, I would be, I was, I described myself as a semi sanctimonious liberal person living in New York City who, you know, didn't agree with the evasion of the uh, Iraq at the beginning and had all kinds of opinions. But then when I read about um, officers and enlisted military personnel returning from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan with these wounds that were both visible and invisible, that, um, uh, resonated and spoke to some of the wounds I'd read about in the Trojan War and that others had written about uh, this connection. Um, it struck me that I should just get off my couch and off my sanctimonious perch and go out and see if I could do something. And all I had was Greek and Latin and this love of ancient texts. But I, I started to see these connections in these early readings we were doing in hospitals that audiences, as I was mentioning before, would get up and speak in the discussions after the readings we did of these ancient plays. And it was like a veil was pulled back and they were showing me what I couldn't see because they'd lived these experiences, whether they were patients or doctors. And then ultimately the military blew the doors wide open in teaching me what Greek tragedy actually is about and what it was for. Um, and so I went around knocking on doors and I tried in my, I grew up in Southeastern Virginia. So I tried to apply all the things I'd learned there about being polite and kind and respectful. Uh, and I had some doors politely closed in my face and some slammed and like everything when you're trying to understand a new culture like the military and all the tribes within the military and all of the nuances of those tribes. I'm sorry, I'm in New York City. I apologize for the uh, sirens, but uh, the, um, uh, you have to, it's trial by error. You just have to learn. So I was chastened and about a year and a half into trying, I guess what I want to clarify, what I was trying to do was find an audience in the military that would be receptive to performing a Greek tragedy from the Trojan War, about the Trojan War, to frame a discussion about some of the timeless experiences of war, in particular, the visible and invisible wounds of war. And um, it wasn't until I met your colleague and mentor and friend, Bill Nash, that doors started to really open. Um, I read a statement he wrote, he said in the New York Times interview, where he said that he uh, began every discussion with um, 
Marines with grunts in particular about combat stress with the ancient story of Sophocles Ajax, which is one of the plays I was working on. And Ajax is a story about a decorated warrior in the Trojan War, the strongest warrior, only second to Achilles, who um, in the last or ninth year of the Trojan War loses uh, his colleague and cousin Achilles and is passed over for the award of Achilles armor by the generals, which is both um, uh, feels like a betrayal on his part of his sacrifice, but also connects him with Achilles, who was his cousin in a way that I think is hard to convey. And pent up years of frustration and grief and anger lead Ajax to do something that he later comes to regret. And after doing that thing that he can't undo, uh, he enters into a suicidal ideation in which he ends up taking his own life on stage. Violence wasn't staged in the ancient world. It was very rarely staged. It was described in ancient plays. But Sophocles, who was a general in the Athenian army and was presenting this play for an audience of 17,000 citizen soldiers in Athens in a century in which they saw nearly 80 years of war, he knew what he was doing when he staged the suicide of Ajax only feet from the thrones in the front of the theater where the generals would have sat, the Stratagoi, the 10 tribal general leaders. And... It was of no small significance. And so it, you know, obviously it took, required enormous risk on the part of the Marine Corps or anybody to say, uh, Navy Bumad to say, yes, please come perform this tragedy for us. But at the time that I met Bill Nash, he, you know, Captain Nash, and was first introduced to the Marine Corps and had this first opportunity, you know, a lot had happened. And it was seen, as I understood it as a civilian, as a career ending gesture in 2007, 2008 for many to raise their hands and say, I'm struggling with an invisible wound. And Congress had appropriated lots of money and resources to address these wounds, but people weren't availing themselves of these resources. And so the military and the Marine Corps in particular, being such a nimble and flexible and innovative culture, was looking for out of the box approaches. And so I wrote an email to Bill Nash and 24 hours later, he's like, I don't know about getting you onto a base, but how about an audience of Marines at a combat stress conference in San Diego? And just cutting to the chase, about a, eight months later, there we were <clears throat> with actors from Broadway and film and television, David Strathairn, um, Jesse Eisenberg went on to play Mark Zuckerberg in the social network, an Ar Iraqi American actress named Heather Raffo, who spoke her part with an Arabic accent. I mean, we were, you know, we were doing all kinds of things to try to connect it with the present moment. Um, and we were given an opportunity to perform for 400 Marines and their spouses, or roughly so, in a Hyatt ballroom in San Diego, and we had no idea what was going to happen. Um, I just had a hunch that it might be helpful to have a conversation about these timeless experiences where hopefully Marines and other military personnel and their spouses could see that not only were they not alone in the room in having had some of these experiences, which were actually normal experiences, loss, betrayal, grief. These are normal human emotions. They're not out of the ordinary combat stress, the continuum of combat stress. I mean, but that they, we could normalize it and they could see that they weren't alone across time, that warriors for thousands of years had had, and that we had a public health message to deliver. You were not alone across time. Well, that was the idea. We performed for the 400 Marines in uh, six scenes from two ancient Greek tragedies. Uh, we scheduled time for a discussion afterwards. Uh, the first person to speak during a discussion was a military spouse we had pre-identified um, named Marcel Waddell. She was a Navy SEALs spouse. And she said, um, hello, my name is Marcel. I'm the proud mother of Marine and the wife of a Navy SEAL. And my husband went away to war just like Ajax did in the play uh, four times in, in my house. And each time he came back drag dragging invisible bodies back into our house. And to quote from the play, our home is a slaughterhouse my translation of the play. And that statement sounds really heavy, but it opened the room. The doors blew off and all of a sudden uh, other spouses started raising their hands. And, and we weren't just hearing from the command sergeant major or the general's wife. We were hearing from Lance corporals and we were hearing from um, all the way down the chain. And, um, and people started quoting lines from the play without notes, as if they'd known Sophocles plays their entire lives. And they were relating these quotes to their own personal experiences coming back from war that they weren't sharing, let alone in private, and let alone in front of 400 of their peers in this rigid hierarchical space where the generals were in the back, you know. Um, uh, and 
uh, and while this started to unfold, we scheduled a 45 minute discussion. The discussion lasted hours and had to be cut off later as it got late. It started to occur to me, we have stumbled across an ancient military technology that was designed to do the very thing that is unfolding in this room. And like an external hard drive, we've somehow figured out a way to dust it off and plug it into a military audience. And the technology still knows what to do. And the military culture knows what to do in response. And I thought I was the translator of the play. I, th I thought I was clever. I translated it from Greek. Uh, but it became clear that the military, the Marines, were translating it in ways that I could never have understood or anticipated until I heard them quoting the lines. And so the translations grew out of these reciprocal relationships with audiences that had lived the experiences the plays described. So at the end of that night, uh, we knew we had um, tapped into something that was just beyond our comprehension and that we were so privileged to be there. And because Marines, as I'm sure you know, uh, since, well, since the beginning of the 20th century have been um, open to press in ways that other branches of the military aren't, they let us invite the press. And a story shot out across the AP and the LA Times, the LA Weekly, the BBC World Service. And the next day, 200 newspapers picked up the story about Marines talking about Greek tragedy and relating it to their experiences coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And that led very briefly and quickly and succinctly to a series of other military performances that landed us adjacent to the Pentagon around a table with colonels and a brigadier general who was saying, we need to do this in football stadiums for 40,000 troops at, at a time. And I'm saying to the general, listen, that's not the scale of theater. And sh she's saying, well, that's the scale of the conversation we need to be having, and we're not. And um, that led to an unprecedented contract. And, and I w left my sort of uh, desk job and started my own company and um, became a defense contractor. And, and that's sort of the, this, the sort of journey from classical education to, to um, setting out in the world with the military as our partner to explore what these ancient war stories actually mean. And were it not for the military, it was a laboratory, a social experiment that whether people like it or not is this incredible melting pot that where you're able to just gain insight upon insight from people of all walks of life. Without the military, all 28 of the other projects that have flown, you know, f come out of it would never have emerged. Um, the military was uh, the, the finishing school of my education with, with uh, Dr. Kuhlman in terms of closing the book and connecting these plays with something palpable and real. So anyway, that's longer than I wanted to be, but that's, that's the story of San Diego and how the, I think it was the second combat operational stress control conference really changed my life. Um, and Bill went on, we, Bill and I collaborated on a whole series of other projects after that together with Brett Litz and um, other sort of uh, luminaries in the um, moral injury world. Mm -hmm. And I guess that was also my finishing school learning from them. Um, learning from Bill about his experience in the second battle of Fallujah. And, and I know you served there as well, but having, having, making those connections with a psycholo psychiatrist who'd had hands on Marines in those kinds of situations deeply informed our approach to other projects rolling out of it. You know, that's, I, I think that is, you know, very compelling that not only uh, the impact on the Marines themselves, but on you and on the development uh, of your way forward uh, with your work. Um, so I'm going to pivot um, and I'm going to ask a question uh, from uh, Lieutenant Commander Patrick Baker, who is one of our stellar uh, social workers here at uh, the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery. And he starts with a comment. Uh, so just to set this question up, and he talks about the Odyssey as being a story of homecoming. And it takes a decade. And, uh, and, and he's, he's citing that there can be tremendous positives in that it allows for a kind of a natural decompression from the theater of war. And in today's environment, we benefit from advances in technology and transportation, can return from a war zone, exercise or deployment very quickly. Uh, and people in general appreciate that expediency, but overlook the benefit of decompression. So his question is, in a world where technology can help us get home quicker, service members can lose the benefit of decompression time. What are some strategies that we can deploy for this transition uh, from your perspective? Well, I really like that question. Um, you know, I, I wanna reinforce that I'm not a mental health professional and, and uh, so any advice I offer is with that grain of salt, I'm a storyteller and a theater director and 
a facilitator of conversations. But I can say um, the ancient Greek model, you know, the, the ancient Greek model was compulsory uh, military participation for all citizens, which are all men, all male citizens. So it's potential that a hundred percent of the audience plus some foreign nationals who were in the audience would have served them, that they would serve in the military. And um, the operational tempo of the ancient world, although it wasn't fly home from the battlefront straight to the, the home front, it wasn't get on Skype and talk to your spouse while you're about to embark or come back from a firefight. Um, those are new modern technologies that have, that have resulted in those experiences. But it was such that the citizen had to come back and function. The soldier had to come back and function as a citizen and then return to being a soldier over and over and over again. And the fabric of ancient Greek society, of the classical Athenian society, hung on the ability of the citizen to make that transition over and over and over again. And so one of the arguments that I make in the book, but also others have made, like Jonathan Shea, um, whose work I know you're familiar with, his book Achilles in Vietnam, he made it forcefully in that book, which I discovered on my journey. And it was one of those like, sort of flashpoints where it's like, oh, I'm on the right path. And then I met Jonathan and we became friends and collaborators and colleagues. And um, he's been a huge influence. But um, he makes this argument that storytelling in the ancient world was born out of the need to hear and tell the soldier or veteran story. And that the Odyssey and the, the Iliad and the Odyssey, these ancient epics that are um, some of the oldest written texts in the Western world are, are not simply entertainment that was sung by bards about war for people to consume, at least not in the beginning. They were stories that were told and retold and sort of inculcated and culturally passed down from generation to generation out of a necessity to convey to successive generations of veterans that you are not alone that you that others have had these experiences that there are words to describe these experiences that feel so isolating and so challenging and so i guess what i guess what i'm uh, you know there are so many I've heard of so many different decompression programs, but what I like about the Athenian model is all citizen soldiers were, you know, if, if you didn't have a ticket, you couldn't afford a ticket. It was provided for you. The state sponsored it. You were sitting together in, a, in um, you know, in a time of war in accordance with your tribe, which was your military unit. And according to rank with the generals in the front and the hoplite soldiers in the back and generals like Sophocles and military veterans like Aeschylus, who was known more for his, war fighting than for his plays, although he was one, arguably the father of Western drama, um, wrote and exchanged these stories about the, these extreme human experiences so that they could be collectively acknowledged in a setting. I wouldn't say that it's safe. People talk about safe spaces a lot. I say it was a brave space where people were being encouraged to do the very thing those Marines did that first night that we discovered the power of ancient Greek tragedy. So... It's not, I don't think it's simply enough from my perspective, and again, take all the, with a grain of salt, to bring warriors back from battle and have them um, watch movies together or do activities together. Or um, I think this, the, the, the technology of storytelling in the ancient world, it, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a provocation, it's an invitation to contemporary warfighters to find ways to catalyze that exchange, to make, to make connections, to tell stories that doesn't require intoxication at the bar, which as I'm sure you know, is the only sanctioned place within military culture where that type of storytelling traditionally has taken place. So without any kind of intoxicant, theater can create that catalyst. Storytelling books can create that catalyst. Um, and I love the idea of a reading list. Um, when we first started out, a lot of the, the flag officers and colonels said, oh, no, the grunts will never appreciate this. This is so above their heads. And, I, you know, I, I always laugh because, of course, the grunts ended up being our best audiences. Um, they didn't need a translation and they didn't need a lot of handholding because they'd lived a lot of the experiences we were describing. They were so close to it. I had a Marine come up to me after one of our performances said at Camp Pendleton, he goes, I liked your little skit. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to myself, 
I said to him, I appreciate that. You're right. It is a skit. Like we don't really care about, I mean, we have these Oscar award-winning actors performing, but the objective is the discussion and discussion in our model lasts longer than the performance. And just like that first night in San Diego is about creating this dialogue. And I said, what did you like about it? The skit. And he said, it had nothing up its sleeve. Oh. Every portrayal I've seen of the military, this grunt said, um, always has some agenda. Um, and this, this was, and I think that's the other thing about decompression and medicine. You know, medicine can some ways get ahead of its own skis. It can get, get in its own way. It, 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 I don't think decompression can feel like medicine and still be effective. You know, like um, once it feels clinical, I think, I mean, I'm the son of two psychologists. And if someone asks me how I feel about my emotions, I shut down too. It's like, you know, there, there's this, this model that the Greeks were engaging in doesn't require any of the jargon. And it's something that we humans are essentially acculturated to do from the moment we're born. It might, might be ingrained in our DNA to tell our stories, to narrate our stories. And I would argue that the best forms or most effective forms of talk-based therapy, which is one modality of healing, involve various strategies for taking charge of your narrative and reframing the narrative of your story. And I think that's all in these ancient stories too. So I, I, that's a roundabout way of answering a question, but I think um, decompression can't feel like medicine, but it shouldn't simply be entertainment and relaxation either. It needs to be serious and rigorous. And I think it needs to honor in a sacred way uh, the intergenerational story of warriors, not just of the present conflicts, and not just of American conflicts, but across cultures and across time to be effective. That's a great segue to your graphic novel. No, thank uh, you. <laughs> you know, because what I what impressed me is the leadership of, of Sergeant Brennan, how he gathers his gathers his troops and he uses the stories from the Odyssey uh, to prepare his his uh, squad for their return. Can you maybe just uh, hit some highlights of uh, of that? Uh, yes, yeah, so that project that project was really fun. It was something we worked on about six, seven years ago. Um, we we started to ask this question because we did. So we've done almost 450 performances of theater of war, and and maybe you could add several hundred other performances of other projects for military audiences. And it's one modality of engaging. We thought, well, are there are any ways we can extend past these conversations. So that people can take something away and go back and go deeper with their units or in their barracks or with their friends or loved ones. Something that could be like a prompt that would go further, but again, wouldn't feel like medicine, would just feel like an extension of what we were doing. And so we had all these ideas of a theater of war video game and um, that we almost got to ground on that. It was, we were really close, but you know, as with any, all things, government and military, you know, that sometimes it doesn't work out. But one of the things that did um, was a graphic novel sort of extension of theater of war. And that was because one of our main collaborators at the Defense Centers of Excellence for Psychological Health and Traumatic Brain Injury went on to DARPA. And when he went to DARPA, he asked us to send us our vision for the graphic novel. And the short story is with DARPA's help and funding and with a, ultimately my publisher, Pantheon and, and Penguin Random House, we developed this graphic novel called The Odyssey of Sergeant Jack Brennan that is a Marine sergeant retelling the parts of Homer's Odyssey that he thinks are germane to his squad on their last night in Kyrgyzstan before the, before, the night before they fly back to San Diego. And he's saying to them, as you said earlier, you know, Odysseus's journey back from the Trojan War takes 20 years. And over that period, one can see that as helpful uh, in terms of the time of progression. But over that period, he sort of loses his way home and his sense of what is home. And it's possible to be home and feel like you're still at sea for 10 years, 20 years as well. And, and so this metaphor of the long journey of the war cuts both directions. And um, so that became the idea. And he says, look, I, it's possible. And the, we gave him a kind of impetus, which is he had lost, you know, this is a fictional character, but he had lost a Marine in one of his other squads to suicide and it caused him to never want that to happen again. So he decided this was his way of 
decompressing with his Marines within the constraints of the fact that they had this small period in Kyrgyzstan around a smoke pit and then, and then they were going to fly back the next day. And as he narrates the story of the Odyssey and connects these various stories within the Odyssey, I mean, like for instance, um, there, there are so many incredible analogs. And again, uh, Jonathan Shea has a book called Odysseus in America, which I recommend as well, that goes into even more detail thinking about sort of present. Jonathan was a VA, uh, until recently VA psychiatrist uh, who worked with first with Vietnam generation, but then later generations and wrote extensively and worked with the Marine Corps and uh, Kosk and uh, Bumet on some developing some of the strategies that are still uh, being implemented, as I understand, in the Marine Corps about combat stress. Um, and th this, but there are several chapters within the Odyssey of Sergeant Jack Brennan, which is a kind of comic book slash graphic novel format. We, um, uh, we, commissioned a number of artists to help us and uh, develop this this approach uh, a few of whom had actually worked with veterans on other projects we also worked with a group of uh enlisted marines to sort of just gut check everything we wrote and also give us sort of dialogue and language to insert here and there that really meant it made it feel authentic and um you know they called us out on a lot of things and then we found our way forward as the marines often do but you know, just for instance, there, you know, um, Odysseus uh, and his men along the way home um, from the Trojan War, uh, after winning the Trojan War, uh, through an act of deceit and participating in a sort of victory that one might argue could be considered a series of war crimes. So it's complicated. It's not just victory. It's um, losing control of order as well, I think. Um, he ends up, uh, his men end up uh, stopping on an island called uh, where the inhabitants are called the Lotus Eaters. And they're people who eat this flower that uh, is an analgesic that causes them to sort of forget and not feel pain. And while his men are out scouting the island, they come upon the Lotus Eaters and they begin to, they, they imbibe, they eat the Lotus and they, um, they immediately sort of lose their way and lose any desire to return home. And then we cut from that to one of, he, he asked one of his squad members to talk about his experience recovering at Walter Reed or wherever, what Balboa um, from, uh, you know, a shrapnel injury and being put on opioids. And he makes this connection between the, the Lotus and drugs or in particular prescription medication. And I feel like, again, without hammering it, without it being didactic, without it being prescriptive, just modeling how these connections get made and then encouraging people, I think at the military level to take this graphic novel into the squad level um, and read it with their troops and then do the very thing that Sergeant Jack Brennan is doing, which is use it as a catalyst for having a dialogue about things that they wouldn't have talked about otherwise, or they might not have talked about unless they were sitting around the bar or doing some extreme support or that was dangerous or whatever it was that gives people that flood of, you know, neuro uh, chemicals that that open them uh, in ways that I think storytelling and theater can do more safely. You know, thank you. I, I will tell you that uh, uh, reading that, uh, you know, uh, reinforced my desire to go back and actually read uh, the Odyssey itself. So, so thank you for that. I, I really appreciate it. And I enjoy that. I thought it was very relevant uh, to issues that our, our Marines experience. I'm going to, I'm going to pivot here now. Uh, and given that this is largely a medical audience, uh, let's talk about uh, end of life care. And certainly you had you described some compelling, uh, you know, uh, situations first with your friend, Laura, uh, who had cystic fibrosis uh, and her and her working through, you know, her terminal illness. Uh, and then uh, your discussions with Dr. Blackhall uh, yeah. and about perhaps the mistakes we make in, in, in modern medicine about end of life. Yeah. So, so thank you. Yeah. So again, as I mentioned before earlier, um, my journey out of academia and into the world involved accruing a series of my own life experiences in my early to mid twenties that changed my relationship to the plays. Like I, I thought I knew what they were about. And then, and I, and I had some sense of, and I had this hunch that they could speak to larger audiences, but until they spoke directly to me and my life experiences, I didn't have the idea of taking them really 
beyond and um, the audiences that would want to see them in a theater theatrical context. And that main experience I had was losing my girlfriend, Laura Rothenberg, uh, when she was 22 and I was uh, 24, 25 years old um, to cystic fibrosis, um, which is a disease that you may know that is mostly pediatric because most, most people don't live very long beyond their uh, childhood years, although they're living longer and longer thanks to advancements in medicine. Um, and she had had a double lung transplant um, in the sort of year, 20 months prior to her death. And I became just by luck and by virtue of timing a kind of her principal caregiver in the last six months of her life. And we moved in together in New York City. And, um, and it was another education, uh, caring for someone that you, I loved, whom I loved, who was suffering and whose suffering I couldn't really address. The suffering was beyond fentanyl. It was beyond, like, it was, it was suffering on psychological, spiritual, emotional, physical, or every level, and all the nuances of that suffering. And then the challenges of being a caregiver who's helplessly witnessing that suffering. And then also being in your 20s and not having any context for life and death and those suffering, that kind of suffering, uh, led me to a different relationship with the Greek tragedies. And in particular, her death did. Um, just to say that I don't mean to fetishize dying. I don't think most people actually have the privilege of getting to choose how they die. Um, uh, but when Laura died, she died in a really graceful and beautiful way in our apartment on um, 13th Street here in New York City um, because she'd thought a lot about her mortality from an early age and had prepared and sort of rehearsed for it and really contemplated what she wanted it to be. And what it ended up being was her fearlessly without an oxygen mask comforting us, uh, her friends and loved ones and her family as she took her last breaths. And that was, um, you know, that was a huge revelation for me that, that death and, and, and sometimes the suffering around death can actually be an opportunity for connection, for making meaning, for saying what you've always wanted to say, for conveying emotions that have been unconveyed. And she left everything on the table. I mean, she, she said it all and did it all. And, kind of showed me a way forward. There was also a fearlessness about the experience of watching her die, the way that she faced her mortality. I mean, of course there was lots of fear, but the way that she ultimately, um, the, she wrote a book called Breathing for a Living, since we're talking about books that I helped her finish um, and then promoted the year after her death. It was published by Hyperion and it was about the year up leading up to and following her double lung transplant. And the last line of the book, is how can I resign myself to death if my greatest fear is not being able to breathe? Question mark. Hmm. And and I thought when she wrote that, that was just so brilliant. She I knew she had weeks left at that point at the most. Um, that's a question. How do how do we face death when when it when everything in our bodies and in our culture tell us to fear it? At least that's how we're acculturated to be, and we don't talk about it. So after she died and this amazing way, all I wanted to do was talk about it with everyone I met on the street. And I was sort of manic about it. And people sort of recoiled. And we don't talk about death in our society. We certainly don't talk about it in the open. Um, and in some ways, one could make the argument that Theater of War and the work that we've done since has been for me an act of healing, but also an extension of that desire to create spaces where people will talk about it. And the plays juice the room with a kind of energy and a and a and move the walls back of the room in a way that create an opportunity for people to have that conversation without actually having to witness someone die um we can rehearse the way that laura rehearsed and think about our mortality and it'll make us more prepared and more evolved and more fearless and open to the opportunities that are around so we don't miss them when they're happening both as caregivers and as patients, as loved ones. And this, this extends to our work, obviously, with medicine as well. I'll just say, since we're talking to a medical audience, we have about seven different medical projects to address the complex ethics and moral suffering of medical professionals. And especially during the pandemic, we've been doing a lot of work for frontline medical professionals. I, I would say the most pervasive myth in American medicine, way beyond the myth myths that we perform in ancient Greek plays, is the myth of infinite compartmentalization. That, that, that you can just keep stocking it away, 
witnessing all this suffering, this kind of detachment that's required to effectively be a surgeon or effectively to be a EMT, whatever you are, um, a nurse, uh, that it doesn't ultimately have a toxic effect if there is enough way to talk about it or channel it into something productive or healthy. And um, so we have performed, you know, for medical audiences in the military, and we perform regularly for medical audiences all over the country and the world. And that that also grew out of my relationship with Laura and her death. When she died at her funeral, there were 300 medical professionals present. Mm. Because no one who met Laura, she was so off the charts of medicine, but she was that rare patient who understood her body and what was happening to it in ways that doctors learn from her. And, um, and the way she took down the defenses of anyone who entered her room and greeted them and humanized them and engaged them resulted in, you know, she was just one of those people. And, you know, it was everything from orderlies to some of the most powerful doctors in New York and Boston who ended up being uh, there at the Memorial in New York city. So I guess if you add all these things together, uh, two psychologists, parents, <laughs> uh, a girlfriend who dies in this way, but also opened the world of medicine to me by way of being her caregiver and the way she showed witnessing death in this way, all the elements. Uh, and then growing up in Hampton Roads, Virginia, surrounded by the military in all directions, but not knowing anyone in the military, you basically have all the elements for what ended up happening later. It makes a lot of sense. Um, you mentioned Leslie Blackhall. She's someone I interview for the book. Um, she's a palliative care doctor at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Um, we, shortly after rolling out Theater of War, um, returned to one, the subject of death and dying uh, because it was so close to me and I wanted to engage audiences. But to be clear, I, what I really wanted to do, because I had experienced palliative care and hospice nursing in Laura's last weeks and months, I wanted to create an opportunity for people in those fields, in palliative care and in hospice in particular, to be taken out of the shadows and to be the main speakers in a room so we could learn from the insights they would bring to the discussion. And people um, often say that in medicine, um, you know, there are, there, you know, that these issues of palliative care and in particular hospice are beyond medicine. But I would argue that there's more medicine in what happens when a person is beyond medical treatment and until they die that we have yet to really fully discover than the, all the medicine that preceded it. And, and that we're just coming up out of the sludge and our understanding of this final phase of life. So I wanted to create a space where those individuals wouldn't be marginalized. We'd hear from them in particular, the nurses. And so we had a, started with a series of performances. U University of Virginia was one of the first places, but we've gone all over the country and the planet, all the way to uh, Qatar and back um, with the project, which, which we called end of life. And Leslie Blackhall, I interview her because she was um, someone who cut her teeth as a physician during the height of the AIDS epidemic at Bellevue Hospital here in New York City and saw with that with that pestilence, you know, um, that um, that plague, um, unimaginable death and suffering that she was unable to address at the beginning, especially of, of the AIDS epidemic. And, um, and it led her to uh, a kind of life mission of finding ways to alleviate that suffering. Um, so I we give ample space, both I give it both in the book, but also in the work that we do out in the world to creating spaces where people will talk about death and dying, the, the challenges of witnessing suffering, the moral uh, residue for medical professionals, but also caregivers of witnessing suffering and not being able to stop it um, or feeling complicit in the suffering for some reason. And that is as large a part of the work that we do, maybe larger now than the work that we've done with the military. Very good. No, that's uh, I, I particularly appreciated that those sections of the book. Um, you, you mentioned COVID and, and maybe just briefly, uh, I think we have about five minutes left. Sure. Um, how did you continue the work during that period of social iso uh, isolation? Were you able to do it virtually or um, uh, how, because that seems like the interaction and the being there uh, is such a critical part of it. So before uh, the pandemic, I was one of these theater director types who would talk about storytelling and theater in these very esoteric terms. Like it's about breathing together and being in spaces together and vibrating. And, you know, I'd say all these things which I'm kind of embarrassed about now because we, uh, out of necessity, had to pivot to a virtual model when COVID began. And 
it took about a month to sort of regroup because we were about to leave with um, CENTCOM for a series of performances of theater of war in Bahrain and Kuwait uh, for a, a naval installation in Bahrain. And in particular, um, there had been an admiral there who committed suicide and uh, General, General McKenzie at the time, who was the leader of CENTCOM, had said, you know, we, we can't wait for our soldiers and sailors, airmen and uh, Marines, coast, coasties to come back to start the conversation. It's clear we have to go to the theater of war with theater of war and start these conversations there. And we were about to leave for the first time to perform theater of war in the theater of war, although we'd performed other projects in some of these countries. Um, they were about alcohol and substance abuse and other subjects for military audiences. This is the first time we were gonna address suicide for, right on. And then the Kuwait airport shut down the day we were leaving. Um, so that was that. Um, so about a month and a half later, we, um, we pivoted to Zoom and we decided to do a project on the isolation of the pandemic because we knew that was isolation is, you know, mm -hmm. one of the chief things that people were suffering from at the time. We were all cut off from each other. And we decided to do a play uh, called Oedipus the King by Sophocles, um, which was written and performed uh, several years after the Athenian plague which killed nearly one third of the Athenian population. We think it now was typhoid fever, fever that, that did this. And so there was no one in the audience of that play that was unaware of the impact of pestilence or of disease because uh, everyone had lost people they loved uh, during the plague. Um, and the play, I won't, won't go into the details, but the play speaks to a lot of the themes we were experiencing at that time. And we got some of our best actors. You mentioned we have really great actors. We had Francis McDormand, two-time Oscar. Oh. Actor, we had Jeffrey Wright playing Tiresias, the blind prophet, John Torturo playing Creon, um, and, uh, and uh, Oscar Isaac from Star Wars playing Oedipus, and, and then a whole slew of other actors. And we put out a shingle without any marketing bucks, and we put it out into the world on social media, and we said to our list, come, come to Zoom. And we had no idea what would happen, and we had uh, well over 12,000 people from 42 countries attend the first event, and the discussion went deeper in some ways, there's trade-offs to everything than any in-person performance could have ever gone because for the first time we were facing each other, like you and I are facing each other right now and looking into each other's personal spaces where we feel way more comfortable than in a crowd, at least I do. Um, and, we, and people were open because of the necessity of connecting. And then we were, go we were jumping into I mean, in the weeks that followed, we did performances where people were speaking, custodians were speaking from their closets with brooms behind them and hospitals at the Bronx were being <laughs> besieged by COVID and nurses in the front, EMTs from their um, ambulances and, and you know, with their uh, phones, uh, women in sh homeless shelters in Brownsville from the kitchens of those shelters and you know, all the rest, we were penetrating into all these spaces we would never have reached. And with CENTCOM's help, we ended up doing a, a series of theater of war performances for troops. And there was a gathered audience about a year later in Tampa in the headquarters. But then we were connecting with other audiences in the theater of war. And we had physical audiences that were there. We were digitally performing and um, I was facilitating digitally. So I'm on a screen and there are multiple locations all at once. Well, who knows if this is going to work? But... <laughs> Uh, it turns out with Theater of War, it was always a disappearing act to begin with. We didn't do it to get applause. I don't need to be liked by the military. I don't, I'm, we're not aspiring to be of the culture. We're just, I don't pretend to be anything other than who I am. But if we've done our work and we've done something of service, then this thing happens where, where the Marines, for instance, in the ballroom take ownership of, of mm -hmm. the story. And they make sense of it in the terms of their own culture. So... And now I was never there to begin with while I was facilitating. I'm disembodied. And this thing happens that is really rich. One of the questions was I had myself was if we were if we were digitally performing and we had a physical series of physical audiences, would the energy in each of these physical rooms dissipate? Would people be less willing to share? Or be, and it only accrued. So we'd go from Bahrain back to, to Saudi Arabia, back to Tampa and the room each room would be more and more ready because they were listening to each other in those rooms. And mm -hmm. so the last two and a half years, we've done 80 plus online events. We're about to do our first in-person performance. I want to invite everyone to watch it online unless you're near South Bend, Indiana on October 3rd. We're going to be performing our project about the war in Ukraine, the Suppliance Project in Ukraine. 
based on Aeschylus's play, The Suppliants, about 50 refugees seeking asylum at an ancient border. And it's about humanizing the refugees, but also interrogating what it will cost for the uh, country that then receives them to either go to war on their behalf or to suffer the the punishment of the gods for ignoring these suppliants. And um, the play is performed by professional actors and the chorus is Ukrainians in this instance, Ukrainian citizens. We're gonna be doing that on the football stadium field at the University cool. of Notre Dame on October 3rd and broadcasting globally at 7 p.m. on Zoom to people all over the world from the football stadium with um, Anthony Edwards, uh, two Emmy Award winning actors, Anthony Edwards and Keith David and Tate Donovan playing the main roles and a chorus of student, Ukrainian students playing the chorus. Um, this is the evolution of our work. COVID permitting, we'll continue to do these physical events where we broadcast out of locations and that will be hugely symbolic, I think, as backdrops. But the mm -hmm. beauty is we can always go back to digital when we need to and it's just as effective in other ways. Um, so we've been busier since wow. May, May of 2020 than we were since the beginning of Theater of War when it took off with the military. I'm really excited. Well, that's, you know, that's terrific. Uh, and, it, and it's clear we strive to be a learning organization, and it's clear that that's fundamental to the Theater of War. So, Yeah, uh, I mean, it, sorry. Ahead. I was just going to say the military, um, you know, it's, it's so refreshing. <laughs> Uh, to work with the military because, in fact, uh, anything is kind of possible. Um, it's just about being able to articulate it on a single piece of paper, like a white paper, <laughs> barely enough to get it done. So, <laughs> Well said. As we wrap up, first of all, thank you so much for your time today. It's, it's, it's been incredibly valuable. Uh, I know I speak for myself and the audience. Um, so given just how, how important this work is, in addition to the, the event in October at Notre Dame, how do we keep track of the growth of the work and how do we how do we follow you? Yeah, I recommend just coming to either our website, which is theater of war spelled the American way, ER of war, theater of war dot com, where you'll see events at the bottom of the page and also links to press and recordings. We just did a CNN and Monpour piece about the, um, the suppliance project Ukraine um, or go to our social media, which is at theater of war again, spelled the American way. Um, you can also join our mailing list on our website at Theater of War, and you'll get invited to every performance. Almost, I would say 95% of our work is public and, and open. Um, and we welcome the Navy medicine community to, I mean, I know we perform for Navy medicine communities, but we'd love to re-engage and stay engaged. And, you know, the problem with the military, as I'm sure you know, sir, is you put your head down, uh, it's both a blessing and a curse. Uh, and all the people you know, knew before are gone, and, and it's as if what you did never happened, and you start again, which can be both good and bad. It's it's you know it's it's good if there's a leader who doesn't like what you do because <laughs> you can move forward, but it's bad because the institutional memory is hard to maintain. So another reason why I was really grateful for the opportunity to speak with you is just to reintroduce what we do uh, yes. as as a tool that's available, and also that not selling it like it, that that it's storytelling is a tool that's available yes. it's not it's not you know the, the reading list is a tool that's available yeah exactly it. and it's clear to tell everybody it's not homework it's just an opportunity so yeah <laughs> <laughs> well i love well, when generals and flag officers volunteer our audiences to be present w would that the uh <laughs> you know a commander-in-chief volunteer everyone to read the book but short of that i'm grateful for uh your endorsement and and uh putting it out there <laughs> well, thank thank you again for your time and, and especially for the work that you do on behalf of, of those of us in the military, but clearly well beyond that. So, so thank you. And uh, again, I highly recommend the book to everybody who has not read it, both books that I mentioned uh, and that we discussed. Uh, I think you'll find them extremely uh, valuable and time well spent. Brian, thank you so much and uh, really appreciate it. Uh, appreciate it. If there's ways that we can help you in the future, we're standing by. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the feeling is mutual and uh, really grateful to have had this time with you, sir. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you. Uh, we're out here. Sounds good. See you soon. Thanks. <laughs>